So I have no disclosures. I will start with the nephrotic conditions in the first uh, 45 minutes, and then we will move on to nephritic conditions. I'm basically uh, discussing only glomerular diseases, uh, since the tubular interstitial and the vascular disease will be dealt with at other, in other sessions as well. So these are the classic, uh, as you know, uh, cardinal signs of glomerular dysfunction. Uh, proteinuria, and obviously in the nephrotic syndrome, it is the proteinuria that dominates uh, the picture. Um, there can be loss of glomerular filtration rate in certain nephrotic states. However, in general, in the nephrotic syndrome, the GFR is normally preserved. Hematuria is minimal in this case. At least uh, uh, most nephrotic conditions are not characterized by significant hematuria or red cell casts. Uh, these combine in the different uh, syndromes, uh, which you are all familiar with. I'm not going to go through those. Uh, however, uh, what is important to realize is that very often what is considered a diagnostic term in morphology also represents non-specific or relatively non-specific patterns of injury. And therefore, the names that I have listed here, even though you may find them uh, in the textbooks as diagnostic entities, are really a group of diseases, a pattern of injury that include a number of diseases that we morphologists need to dissect further. And very often this dissection and to come to the final diagnosis includes the correlation with the clinical aspect. And therefore, the diagnosis of focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis, for example, is incomplete unless you add whether this is a primary form of porocyte injury with an nephrotic syndrome or whether this is adaptive, for example. This is clear or more clear in the crescentic glomerular nephritis. If the diagnosis comes back, crescentic glomerular nephritis, you, you normally need to know, is this an anti-GBM disease? Is it a post-immune crescentic GN? Or is it an immune complex mediated crescentic GN? And therefore, what appears to be a morphologic diagnosis is really a pattern of injury. And my job this morning is to try to uh, go through with you the differential diagnosis of these different patterns of injury. Before we do that, you already heard from Melanie a lot of the physiology. Remember, this is a very unique, the glomerulus is a very unique a microcirculation placed between two resistance vessels, afferent and efferent arterial, and therefore the pressure inside this capillary is a lot higher. You can view the glomerular capillary network as a modified arterial rather than a real capillary. The real capillary is actually located is the peritubular capillary between the tubules, as you see here. So this is really a modified arterial, if you want, functionally, morphologically, as well as from a clinical point of view, disease point of view. Uh, whenever you have arteriolar injury elsewhere in the body, a petechial injury, for example, in the kidney you will have a glomerulitis, you will have an inflammation of the glomerular uh, capillaries, which is basically a small vessel, if you want. And the same is true for focal necrotizing and crescentic GN. Those are usually the expression of diseases that we classify as polyangiitis. So this is the, the uniqueness of this uh, uh, structure. On the other hand, Functionally, this capillary has a completely different uh, styling forces, as you, may see, as you can see here, compared to a peripheral capillary. The inter, uh, intercapillary uh, hydrostatic pressure difference is much, much higher than in the uh, peripheral capillary. Uh, you also know that the flow, the ultrafiltration flux, is unidirectional. It goes from the capillary out in the, in the 
Bowman's capsule, whereas in the capillary, in the conventional capillary, you have uh, efflux of fluid in the arteriolar end, and you have reabsorption of fluid at the more uh, venular end. Therefore, we can consider the glomerular capillary as only the arteriolar half of a conventional capillary. The other half, the venular half, is of course located in the peritubular capillary. The other unique aspect of this capillary, as opposed to any other capillary that I have listed here, is that the hydraulic conductivity is orders of magnitude, notice here, orders of magnitude higher than any other capillary. That means that this capillary is designed to filter. It has open fenestra in the endothelium, it has in, um, filtrations in the diaphragm, and the capillary uh, basement membrane is relatively thin and relatively open with spaces that allow a, a high uh, flow of, uh, of fluid uh, across uh, this, this barrier. I have exemplified here, or have uh, shown this uh, increased hydraulic conductivity by the arrows. But we should not forget that there is a tremendous shear stress on the endothelium due to this increased blood flow, to the very high blood flow that this capillary sustains as opposed to any other capillary. And I have uh, made some calculations here. And if you consider the various weights of the organs, and the relatively, relative blood flow, you have to consider the kidney has one of the highest blood flows of any organ in the body. But if you consider that all the blood that goes through the kidney has first to go through the glomerular, uh, uh, the sum of the glomeruli, you can calculate that we only have 8.4 grams of glomeruli, and these 8.4 grams of glomeruli receive the same flow than 1,400 grams of brain. And therefore, per gram of tissue, the glomerulus, again, you can see, has orders of magnitude much flow. And this probably explains the reason why the kidney, or the glomerulus in particular, is so vulnerable to diseases of the endothelium. The hemolytic uremic syndrome expresses itself predominantly as a glomerular injury. And other organs may not be affected by the same pathology as much as the kidney. And that is because the sheer stress on the endothelium in the glomerulus is so, probably so much higher than in any other uh, capillary in the, in the body. So we will discuss uh, in the first part the proteinuric conditions. And the proteinuria, especially when you have the nephrotic syndrome, is characterized by injury to this cell, to the glomerular visceral epithelial cell or porocyte. Opposed to that is when you have injury to the more proximal layers of the capillary wall, the endothelium, the lamina rata interna. In that case, the response is an inflammatory response. Inflammation and thrombosis very often go hand in hand. And when you have inflammation, you always have a small degree of thrombosis and vice versa. When you have predominantly thrombotic disease, not infrequently will you have a small amount of inflammation. And you will see eventually, as we discuss the nephritic conditions in the second part of this talk, that there is always a certain component of thrombosis when you have endothelial injury with predominant uh, inflammation. So let's discuss uh, at this point uh, the porocyte injury. Nephrotic syndrome uh, is characterized by the features that you are all familiar with. And the structural abnormalities that correspond to this nephrotic syndrome is invariably simplification, effacement, or so-called fusion of the foot processes of the glomerular visceral epithelial cell. Maybe it's a useful concept to denominate these conditions as primary porocytopathies. The porocyte is the target of the injury in these uh, diseases. And here you have an example. The foot processes are completely effaced. 
In this patient, this is a newborn. You can see it because the basement membrane is extremely thin. It hasn't developed yet the normal amount of collagen. But the foot processes are completely effaced. And where two adjacent cells join, they join not through a filtration slit diaphragm, which you would expect at this level, for example, or at this level, they join with tight junctions. And that is because the filtration slit diaphragms are missing in these patients with the so-called Finnish type congenital nephrotic syndrome. And here you have the porocytes under normal circumstances with the uh, filtration slit diaphragms. And these filtration slit diaphragms are composed of a number of proteins that assemble into this very fine structure. And when this nephrine is missing, one of the proteins that constitute this little uh, um, uh, diaphragm here, when this is missing, congenitally defective, you will not establish uh, these filtrations and diaphragms between adjacent foot processes, and therefore the patient is born with diffuse effacement of foot processes, if you want. A primary podocytopathy, in this case, genetically dependent, genetically uh, um, uh, uh, f f caused by genetic abnormalities in this, in this particular gene. There are other genes that also uh, contribute to uh, this filtration slit diaphragm, in particular porosin. And when porosin is defective, you also have a relatively early development of the nephrotic uh, syndrome in, in these patients. So a number of proteins have been uh, shown these days to determine the uh, porocyte behavior the normal interdigitation of the porocytes, and these proteins are listed here. Nephrin, porosin, CD2-associated proteins, and to some extent in Wilms tumor, in Wilms tumor you get the same defect or with diffuse effacement of foot processes. Now, there are other genetic abnormalities of other proteins that also lead to a more slow decay of the porocyte. So these patients with familiar focal and segmental sclerosis usually don't present since birth with proteinuria. They develop slowly progressive proteinuria, increasing with age. And around the age of 30 or 40, they develop end-stage kidney disease, yes, with significant proteinuria at that point. So in this case, the porocyte probably suffers a, an early senescence. It does not survive the normal span of our lives, but senesce earlier, and in the process of senescing, you have focal and segmental sclerosis, which is nothing much but an obsolescent area of the capillary devoid of porocytes. Here the porocytes have a lower survival rate, if you want, uh, and, and slowly uh, die off. Here you have an example of focal and segmental sclerosis morphologically indistinguishable from the idiopathic variant of the acquired nephrotic syndrome. And here you see that these patients have normally preserved foot processes over many, many areas, but then there are other areas in which the foot processes clearly are effaced and simplified. There are other genetic abnormalities that can also produce proteinuria, usually slowly progressive. Uh, usually the biopsy also will show focal and segmental glomerular sclerosis. And I'm emphasizing the focal and segmental sclerosis so you get accustomed to the notion that focal and segmental sclerosis is a very often a sign of porocyte injury, and it can be acquired or it can be genetic, as in these cases that I have uh, exemplified and I have listed on these uh, slides. The more common the porocyte, porocytopathies are, of course, of course uh, acquired. And um, the diseases that are normally associated with this type of pathology are minimal change disease and primary or idiopathic focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis, as listed here in the first two uh, highlighted uh, uh, patterns of injury. The third pattern of injury that we will discuss, of course, is membranous nephropathy, in which 
the attack is slightly different. The form of injury is different from the minimal change disease and primary focal sclerosis. It is useful to consider these diseases as a porocytopathy, in this case, an acquired porocytopathy, not an inherited porocytopathy. And the two diseases, as I mentioned, are minimal change disease, or like I would like to call them these days, diffuse porocytopathy with minimal changes, or idiopathic or primary focal sclerosis. And I emphasize this uh, qualifier because the focal sclerosis, as I already hinted at, can be secondary to genetic abnormalities in the cases of familiar focal sclerosis, or as you will see as we discuss further, uh, adaptive changes or scarring. Diffuse protocytopathy with focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis when the patient usually presents with the full-blown nephrotic syndrome. In minimal change disease, the glomeruli are optically, at the light microscopic level, entirely normal. There is no abnormality, and you can see it here at higher power. Not infrequently do you see damage of the tubules in patients that present with sudden onset of nephrotic syndrome, and therefore, an elevated serum creatinine is not a contraindication, is not a, against the diagnosis of minimal change disease. So minimal change disease is really only, we can only diagnose minimal change disease uh, morphologically if we do electromicroscopy, because the light microscopy and the immunofluorescence microscopy are entirely normal. Occasionally, we have seen that a certain number of patients with minimal change disease have some porocyte staining of IgG, and you can see it here. It's a very fine dusting over what looks like to be the, um, uh, the uh, Bowman's space. We don't know exactly the meaning of this IgG staining of the porocyte, and we're trying to, to figure this out. It's difficult to imagine um, um, what this could be. Uh, however, we have not completely ruled out that maybe some antibodies may be playing a role, although uh, the, the defects that usually result in minimal change disease are usually T cell dependent and not B cell dependent. So morphologically at the ultrastructural level, you see diffuse effacement of foot processes. There are very few filtration slit diaphragms between adjacent foot processes. Here is, for example, one the majority of the surface is covered by a continuous uh, porocyte layer, if, if you want. The porocytes can show also vacuoles, and here you have two of them uh, exemplified here, or lipid, lipid droplets can also be present. The surface of the porocytes very often show these microvillous extensions. In some areas, it, this is much more uh, dramatic. As I mentioned, it is not infrequent, both in children as well as in adults, uh, when there is a very sudden onset of the nephrotic syndrome to have a certain degree of uh, an elevation of serum creatinine. This is an older study here, but the, the studies have been repeated over, over the years. There are at least 10 studies that show basically the same uh, story, namely that some patients with minimal change disease can present with acute renal failure with an elevated serum creatinine, and very often those patients tend, tend to have ATN, uh, as, as you can see here, ATN morphologically demonstrable uh, on the biopsy, and they tend to have a little more vascular injury than the patients uh, 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 without vascular injury. But I have to emphasize, for those of you who are pediatricians or pediatric nephrologists, uh, also children can present with a reduction in the GFR in the very early phases of a minimal change disease of the nephrotic syndrome. Here you can see an example of a patient presented with minimal change disease and acute tubular necrosis. You can see here is a mitotic uh, figure, a, a cell that just underwent, tubular cell that underwent mitosis as evidence of tubular injury. This is potentially related to uh, hypovolemia, potentially low perfusion rate, and if you associate that with vascular sclerosis, you can imagine that the tubules may suffer some ischemic injury during the onset of the nephrotic syndrome. 
Another form of renal failure and nephrotic syndrome is, of course, acute interstitial nephritis. And these are usually drug-induced processes. And some patients, for reasons that we don't quite understand, uh, probably through immune mechanisms, uh, have this combination of acute interstitial nephritis and the nephrotic syndrome due to minimal change disease. Usually, when the drug is suspended, the offending drug is suspended, the interstitial disease improves uh, as well as the nephrotic syndrome. And therefore, a patient with a sudden onset of nephrotic syndrome and some renal failure, you need to consider drug-induced interstitial nephritis. And the relevance of this is that if you suspend the drug, of course, both of these conditions, the interstitial disease as well as the glomerular disease, will spontaneously remit and rather quickly sometimes. Here is a paper, again, an older paper, but again, there have been numerous papers in which patients with what looks like or what presented like minimal change disease, a good proportion of these patients had a history of the use of certain drugs and the combination of an interstitial nephritis with minimal change disease. Some drugs can induce just the minimal change disease by itself without the associated acute interstitial nephritis. So in minimal change disease, always consider the possibility of uh, basically there is not a single kidney disease that we diagnose by biopsy that could not potentially be drug-induced. And this includes crescentic GN, it includes membranous GN, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So clinical conditions, and this is what I meant by dissecting this morphologic pattern further, uh, the clinical conditions that are associated with what we call diffuse protocytopathy with minimal changes or minimal change disease is, of course, idiopathic in which we don't know at the present time a cause or a, or a, and we have ruled out any known association. The secondary forms of minimal change disease are already, as already mentioned, the drug-induced minimal change disease with or without interstitial nephritis. Some early stages of collapsing GN can be, can be misdiagnosed or can be recognized as minimal change disease for so collapsing GN. Uh, uh, both HIV-associated and idiopathic otherwise uh, can be presenting as, as minimal change disease. Some patients with lymphoproliferative disorders have a component of minimal change disease. You treat the lymphoma uh, and the minimal change disease uh, disappears. And this is important, especially in older patients that have all of a sudden develop minimal change disease. Keep in mind uh, to look for paraproteins. Many of these lymphomas or leukemias are B-cell uh, related and can have abnormalities in the light chains or abnormalities in the uh, immunofixation. And therefore, if you treat this underlying lymphoma, the minimal change disease will go away. And therefore, uh, just treating non-specifically or symptomatically the minimal change disease may not get to the root of the problem in these patients. Some children and also adults develop minimal change disease in response to sudden immunologic stimuli like insect bites or immunizations. Uh, and finally, minimal change disease is quite frequent because, and since we don't know exactly, the triggering factors can be associated with other conditions. A diabetic that has mild form of diabetes that develops sudden onset of the nephrotic syndrome, you need to consider a, a, a minimal change disease superimposed on a certain degree of uh, lupus. And the same is true for other diseases that are uh, frequent. Uh, lupus can have a component of minimal change disease, whether it is the lupus pathology that triggers the minimal change disease, whether this is independent to diseases, is difficult to dissect at this point. Uh, and finally, IgA nephropathy can also be associated with heavy proteinuria, and the biopsy in that case shows diffuse effacement of food processes in the absence of advanced lesion of IgA, uh, which if it is advanced IgA, of course you can have nephrotic range proteinuria, uh, but when the biopsy shows relatively preserved tissue with not very advanced IgA disease and you have the nephrotic syndrome, not infrequently can you find a minimal change disease associated uh, to IgA nephropathy. 
Focal and segmental sclerosis is one of the bigger problems that we have. And I must tell you that uh, very many cases are misdiagnosed or misinterpreted at least. Focal sclerosis is a lesion that we all have. I tell the students usually that you and I have focal and segmental sclerosis. I have more because I'm older, but this is the way the kidney senesces, the glomeruli senesce by insufficiency of the porocyte, the porocytes die, at that point they form segmental sclerosis, eventually that advances to the rest of the glomerular tuft and you have global sclerosis. And as we senesce, as we get older, more and more global sclerosis and segmental sclerosis will be present on biopsies. And therefore, focal and segmental sclerosis by itself is not a disease, it's not a diagnosis, it's a lesion and one has to differentiate this. Many morphologic classifications have been proposed. They are all useless. And I propose that you forget about them because they have no correlation whatsoever with the clinical presentation or uh, treatment. And therefore, uh, it's just mm, a waste of time. Uh, much more useful is to look for the source of the proteinuria. If the patient has diffuse effacement of food processes, we like to call it primary idiopathic focal sclerosis, a focal sclerosis that you can anticipate to respond to the same treatment that you would institute in a patient with minimal change disease, or at least a certain proportion of these patients will have, if not a complete, at least a partial response to the treatment of a diffuse protocytopathy. In this particular case, you have only some glomeruli involved, and you can see on this low power view, only one or two glomeruli have segmental sclerosis. Here you have the morphologic expression, the collapse of the capillaries, the increase in, in matrix here, the adhesion of the tuft to Bowman's capsule and the hyaline uh, occlusion of some capillaries. Sometimes you have foam cells in there. This is a classic focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. Just by looking at this by light microscopy, I could not tell you whether this patient is going to respond to steroids or not, or what the cause of this segmental sclerosis is. You need electron microscopy to do this. The immunofluorescence usually shows IgM in the areas of hyalinosis, and this is pretty nonspecific. This does not mean it's an immune complex disease. IgM is a large macromolecule that gets entrapped in the areas of sclerosis in general. Like minimal change disease, the patients with idiopathic focus have diffuse effacement of food process. I'm showing you a low power of a normally, of a normal looking glomerulus in a patient with focal and segmental sclerosis. And the high power again shows the diffuse effacement of the food processes in every capillary, in every glomerulus. Whether the glomerulus has segmental sclerosis or not, it will have diffuse effacement of food processes very similar process as in minimal change disease. And this is why many people, myself included, consider minimal change disease and focal sclerosis uh, two uh, levels of a spectrum. Both of them are characterized by diffuse protocytopathy. In some of them, you don't have segmental uh, scarring, you don't have porocyte insufficiency or catastrophic failure of the porocytes that results in focal sclerosis. Uh, and, and um, in other patients you do. The areas of segmental sclerosis are usually characterized by hyaline, and you can see here the porocytes are completely missing from this area of the cap, right? They are completely detached. Here you see little fragments of porocytes still hanging on to the basement membrane. So basically, focal and segmental sclerosis is a maximal failure of the porocyte where the porocyte gets completely detached uh, from the basement membrane, and probably because of primary injury uh, of that particular uh, porocyte. The defects in the capri wall, where the porocytes are no longer covering the basement membrane, or the areas where the filtration slit diaphragms are missing altogether because of this 
protocyte insufficiency are the areas of hyperfiltration. Here you have removed the resistor, one resistor, to the glomerular filtration rate, namely the filtration slit diaphragm, and therefore the resistance of the flow of water is, or convective flow, is diminished, and therefore you have an increased convection. Under normal circumstances, when the flow is even through numerous pores, which are considered the filtration slit diaphragms, you know that the negative charges or the albumin are sufficient uh, to reflect back the albumin, what people have called the reflection coefficient of proteins. Negatively charged proteins under these circumstances do not enter the capillary wall and are reflected back by the negative charges of the endothelium and of the basement membrane. When you increase the flow because you have removed the resistor, the filtration slit diaphragm at the distal end here, you increase the convective flow through these areas, especially the pressure in these capillaries has increased. And at this point, the negative charges of the endothelium become insufficient and cannot reflect back all the protein, and therefore the protein, the albumin in particular, is convected across these areas where there are defects of the filtration slit diaphragm. And therefore, the paradox of a more tighter capillary wall with fusion of food processes and increased permeability to proteins can be explained on the basis of these defects that are difficult to see sometimes even by electron microscopy. Not always do we see them in patients with a, a primary focal sclerosis or minimal change disease for that matter. Different from the idiopathic or primary focal sclerosis is the segmental scarring. The segmental scarring, and I will come to the other difference in a second, the segmental scarring is due to, like in this case, you see here scar collagen in addition to the hyaline and the basement membrane collagen. This is due to patients with inactive glomerulitis. The glomerulitis heals and leaves behind an area of segmental sclerosis. These patients usually have some level of proteinuria uh, at the beginning of the disease, usually not nephrotic, and therefore this segmental scarring has to be differentiated from the idiopathic focal. Also, these patients have only very segmental effacement of foot processes. This is important to differentiate from focal sclerosis because in this patient you may look for, you may want to look for an anchor disease or you may want to look for other focal uh, glomerulitides that can result in scarring. Especially the anchor disease can be intermittent and when you find a, disease, a, a glomerular sc scarring like this, we usually do serial sections through the biopsy to see if we also have active disease in this particular patient. But not all patients have active disease all the time, and therefore you may just find this focal and segmental scarring. Again, the diseases that result in focal uh, uh, necrotizing and crescentic GN can uh, result also in this type of scarring that needs to be differentiated from the nephrotic syndrome and focal sclerosis. Much more important and much, much more frequent than idiopathic focal sclerosis with diffuse effacement is the secondary or adaptive focal sclerosis. This, of course, became clear when uh, the uh, idea of hyperfiltration uh, was studies, uh, studied here in Boston. For example, here you have a patient that was born with a single kidney and became uh, slightly obese in his 20s, developed increasing proteinuria at the beginning non-nephrotic range, eventually nephrotic range, and when the proteinuria reached a four gram per, per day level, a biopsy was done. This was an open biopsy. You can see huge glomeruli. Uh, associated, associated, of course, with unilateral renal agenesis, and here a glomerulus with segmental sclerosis, indistinguishable from the idiopathic variant. But notice here, foot processes in general were well preserved in this patient, and therefore a primary porocytopathy could be ruled out. And therefore, the corollary for you is to understand this patient will not respond to steroids or cytotoxic drugs or, <clears throat> or anything else. And therefore, the mechanism to prevent further damage is, of course, to unload the uh, pressure, unload the, the glomerular pressure, and therefore an ACE inhibitor, low protein diet, or, or certain calcium channel blockers. Another example 
uh, long known for the last uh, half century by Kinkite Smith. She reported patients with uh, reflux nephropathy and chronic pyelonephritis in the areas that are preserved in these patients, the non-scarred area, you will find focal and segmental sclerosis. And she actually wrote a paper in the, in the 60s or 70s uh, questioning whether these patients with focal sclerosis and reflux nephropathy had two diseases or whether the uh, focal and segmental sclerosis is just an expression of this advanced form of uh, chronic kidney disease. And again, today we understand that this, these patients all develop adaptive kind of focal, secondary focal sclerosis with largely preserved foot processes over uh, the, the capris, as you can see here. In women, very often at the age of 50 or 60, they begin to develop chronic kidney disease with proteinuria, and these patients frequently have a focal and segmental sclerosis. With the history of preeclampsia, one should consider a procoagulant state or some other form of vascular injury that during pregnancy, of course, manifests itself with placental insufficiency later in life, it presents itself with renal insufficiency. There is a lot of connection between the circulation of the placenta and the kidney, and patients, uh, the women with higher numbers of preeclamptic episodes during pregnancy have an increased risk of chronic kidney disease later in life. And therefore, chronic vascular form of injury procoagulant states that are often the cause of preeclampsia and other pregnancy-related complications should be considered in patients with focal and segmental sclerosis um, and, and chronic thrombotic. The EM in this case shows the classic features of chronic thrombotic angiopathy with endothelial dysfunction, with interposition of cells, with a membranal proliferative pattern <coughs> of injury. Now, in African Americans, not infrequently do we find segmental sclerosis, and here you have what people have called hypertension associated with chronic kidney disease. In African Americans, a great number of these patients have focal and segmental sclerosis, and you should consider uh, genetic defects or variants of the APOL1 um, um, gene in, in these particular patients. Here you have an example, the segmental sclerosis in a patient with classic segmental sclerosis and largely preserved foot processes in the uninvolved glomeruli. So when you have a kidney biopsy, uh, and you have a choice of glomeruli to look for electromicroscopic changes, you need to choose the better preserved glomerulus. So you would have to choose this glomerulus and not this glomerulus. If you choose the glomerulus with segmental sclerosis, you're going to find extensive effacement of foot processes. So the differentiation between idiopathic focal sclerosis and adaptive focal sclerosis, you have to choose the better preserved glomerulus. If this glomerulus has diffuse effacement of foot processes, you have a diffuse prosthetopathy primary focal sclerosis. If this glomerulus has preserved foot processes, like in this particular case, and you see it here. I have lost the pointer. Here, you have it. Um, you have preservation of foot This is a secondary focal and segmental sclerosis. Well, you know the story of the APOL1. Uh, these patients have a high tendency of uh, presenting with what people have called hypertension associated with chronic kidney disease, but also collapsing a GN. Another form of adaptive focal sclerosis is present in many often in patients with cystic disease. So when you have a, a patient with extensive chronic changes of the cortex, like you see here, with extensive global sclerosis and segmental sclerosis, as shown here, you need to sometimes question whether these patients have a genetic abnormality that results in so-called medullary cystic disease. These days, the group of medullary cystic diseases of the adult has been merged into another concept, which is chronic tubal interstitial uh, disease. And very often, there are genetic abnormalities uh, as the cause of medullary, the old terminology, medullary cystic disease or, or, or chronic tubal interstitial uh, um, uh, disease uh, in the more modern terminology. Here you have another example of an acquired form of adaptive focal sclerosis, patient with metabolic syndrome, usually morbid obesity, 
with or without sleep apnea. These patients have focal and segmental sclerosis indistinguishable from the idiopathic variant. These patients present usually with slowly increasing proteinuria with levels of protein that can be approaching nephrotic range. Eventually, it can be nephrotic range. The glomeruli are usually hypertrophied, as shown here. And again, the foot processes are preserved. So this is not a primary porocytopathy. If you treat these patients with steroids, you make the disease worse or the process worse. And therefore, without electron microscopy, you cannot differentiate uh, these various conditions. Now, clinically, of course, there is a way in which uh, you can. Now, the history is frequently, as we mentioned already, unilateral genesis or reflux nephropathy. These are the examples that I showed you, or women with preeclampsia and other prothrombotic states that develop focal and segmental sclerosis of the adaptive form. Conditions with an initial loss, again, arterial and arterial sclerosis in blacks consider the possibility of uh, risk variants of APOL1 in patients with focal sclerosis, especially if the patient does not present from the beginning with the overt nephrotic syndrome. Slowly progressive proteinuria and eventually reaching nephrotic range proteinuria or even becoming nephrotic is characteristic of these diseases. And finally, not to forget obesity associated proteinuria uh, is also adaptive in nature. So the idiopathic form is sudden and onset, the nephrotic syndrome, usually with full blown edema. No history of prior kidney disease in these patients with idiopathic focus sclerosis. The glomerula are usually much more normal in size, but there is diffuse effacement of food processes. Uh, of the glomerular epithelial cells. No significant parenchymal atrophy at the beginning of the disease. Clinically, as opposed to the adaptive forms, you have a slowly progressive proteinuria, usually without edema at the beginning. There is a history of prior kidney disease in women. Very important to find out the, the uh, uh, pregnancy-related complications. Uh, there is glomerular hypertrophy of the preserved glomeruli Foot processes are largely preserved if you look for the preserved glomerulus by electron microscopy. Don't look at the injured glomerulus because that will have, focal, will have effacement of foot processes anyhow. And usually in these patients, you can document long-standing pre-existing pre uh, kidney injury. Morphologically, again, very clearly, on the left-hand side, idiopathic focal sclerosis. On the right-hand side, adaptive focal sclerosis with preservation of food processes. Collapsing GN has been considered a subgroup morphologically of focal and segmental sclerosis. <clears throat> I think this is a pattern all by itself. Uh, yes, collapsing lesions, when they heal, leave behind segmental sclerosis. And therefore, there is an association between these two ideas. But let me show you collapsing glomerulus. I think it's a pattern. It can be seen and was described first in patients with HIV-associated nephropathy as HIV-associated nef uh, nephropathy in patients with HIV infection. But we have recognized this pattern of injury now in many other conditions, and I will come through that. Here, the glomerular uh, capillaries are all collapsed, <clears throat> and the epithelial cells are very prominent and vacuolated, as you see here. This can be confused with crescent sometimes, and one has to be uh, very careful, especially when the patient has 15 or 20 grams of proteinuria, and you get the diagnosis of crescentic GN, you should put a question mark on that. So it can be confused with crescentic GN. The porocytes are very prominent, damaged with vacuoles, with protein reabsorption grams as you see here by the arrows. Uh, here you can see the difference between a normal glomerulus without collapse and the glomerulus with collapsing GN. Not only are the prominent porocytes here, por epithelial cells, but the capillaries are all closed up because the tuft has collapsed on itself. The porocytes actually help keep the glomerular capillaries open when the porocytes are insufficient and defective. The underlying porocytes just collapse. Um, um, so this is collapsing GN. This is normal on the, on the left. <clears throat> 
Here you can see by immunofluorescence the reabsorption granules, in this case positive for albumin, they're positive for IgG, for IgA, for all kinds of plasma proteins. So that's kind of nonspecific. And here you see completely collapsed capillaries with complete effacement of food processes, complete damage of the porocytes in this particular. Two capillaries here are completely collapsed, uh, occluded by, by swollen endothelial cells. Sometimes you see tubular reticular inclusions in the endothelial cells, in which case you should, one should suspect HIV nephropathy. We see this less and less, as you can imagine, with effective treatment of HIV. Uh, HIV nephropathy is almost a diagnosis of the past, but not the consequences of patients with HIV because they may develop progressive glomerulosclerosis because of the injury. So collapsing glomerulopathy can be seen in HIV infection. It has been associated with other infections, parvovirus, CMV, HTLV, polyomavirus, and so on and so forth. And we will come back to these infections and collapsing GN in a second. Autoimmune disorders such as lupus and Stills disease, in particular in African Americans, can result in collapsing GN. Also, these infections in African Americans with the APOL1 is critical. Patients with hemophagocytic syndrome have been reported to show massive proteinuria and collapsing GN. Some malignancies have been associated with, uh, with the occurrence in some patients, probably patients at risk. Immunosuppressions, uh, yeah, other forms of immunosuppression uh, can result in collapsing GN in the allograft. So uh, in the allograft, you have recurrent collapsing GN. Certain drugs are associated with collapsing GN. In particular, in patients that are predisposed to this, namely African Americans with APOL1 abnormalities. In particular, when you expose these patients to any form of immunotherapy, uh, in particular interferon, these patients will develop collapsing GN with high levels of proteinuria and sometimes the nephrotic syndrome. And all this is relevant in African Americans when they carry one of the two risk variants of familiar uh, of, uh, of the APOL1. And therefore, in African Americans with heavy proteinuria, one should suspect this in the setting of any of these triggering factors or intercurrent processes. Here you have an example of a very early case in the 89 of a patient with HIV. You can see heavy proteinuria with renal failure then it, 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 at that time there was no treatment for this. It spontaneously regresses and then slowly progresses over the ensuing years. At this point, the patient had focal and segmental sclerosis of the classic morphologic variant, um, uh, probably because of active episodes of collapsing uh, GM. And finally, membranous nephropathy. You have a whole, a whole uh, lecture on membranous nephropathy, so I will only emphasize the morphologic aspects. Of course, in a case like this, the basement membranes are thickened. Not always can you recognize this because the very early phases of membranous nephropathy can be confused with minimal change disease. There is no thickening yet of the basement membrane in the early phases. This is obvious. Uh, uh, there is very thick, there are very thick basement membranes, and if you look at the silver stain, you will see those of you sitting in the front can probably see the spikes, the classic uh, extensions of basement membrane material here, uh, exemplified by the uh, silver stain. There are immunoglobulin deposits there along all the peripheral capillary wall, very discrete, and you can see them here, tiny deposits along the capillary wall along the basal membranes. Usually the IgG4 is the dominant immunoglobulin in, in patients with the idiopathic or so-called idiopathic variant. Again, something that we should avoid in the future. Uh, as you will see, uh, these patients, some of a subgroup, 70% of them have antibodies against the phospholipase A2 receptor, which you can stain in these patients by immunofluorescence microscopy. As you can see here, this patient is phospholipase A2 receptor positive, and gamma IgG4 is the dominant immunoglobulin. So it fits very well. So you can determine the phospholipase A2 receptor in the serum, of course, very useful for you to, as you will hear from Larry Beck later this morning, or, or David Saland, I'm not sure who of the two will, will talk to you about this. And therefore, on the biopsy, you can demonstrate the antigen 
the target antigen. And therefore, the notion of an idiopathic membranous nephropathy belongs to the past. And, and that today we should call this a phospholipase A2 receptor positive membranous nephropathy. Uh, uh, here you see the electron microscopy with the classic deposits in the subepithelium with the spikes of basement membrane in between. The dense material are the deposits, the immune complexes. The lighter staining material is basement membrane material. And of course, diffuse effacement of foot, foot processes that corresponds to the nephrotic syndrome clinically. Larry Beck will explain more to you about the phospholipase A2 and potentially uh, other uh, um, antigens that can be uh, the source of this. And therefore, the so-called idiopathic membranous nephropathy, we should uh, eliminate this because we know uh, about enough uh, antigens that can cause membranous nephropathy. The M-type 2 phospholipase A2 receptor in 70% of patients, uh, some uh, Japanese uh, research Researchers some decade ago uh, demonstrate some of these patients are positive for alpha inulase. In children with membranous nephropathy, it's a milk protein and bovine albumin that is the, the target of, uh, of this that deposits in the subepithelial space. And some patients with congenital nephrotic syndrome have antibodies against a neutral endopeptidase against which the mother was immunized because she is null similar to the RH incompatibility. Uh, the, the, the baby is neutral endopeptidase positive, the mother develops antibodies, and therefore uh, the patient is born with the nephrotic syndrome, which then regresses. Second group of diseases in which membranous nephropathy or the membranous pattern is frequent present, of course lupus, some patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and other autoimmune diseases, membranous is just an expression of an altered autoimmunity. Uh, some of these patients may have uh, uh, antibodies against the phospholipase A2, uh, others may be uh, negative. Chronic infections, for the same reason, uh, probably also develop uh, with increased frequency membranous nephropathy, and then finally, don't forget the drugs. There are many drugs that are associated with membranous uh, nephropathy, uh, uh, and some of these drugs can also give you an anchor disease, and therefore, when you have a crescentic GN, as you will hear later, um, with e antibodies and immune complexes in the, in the glomerula, you should think of a drug-induced anchor positive disease. A number of tumors have been associated with membranous pattern, carcinomas in particular, however, also some lymphomas, and sometimes CLL is associated with this altered autoimmunity. <laughs> 